And we are live! Good day, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time it is in your neck of the woods. My name is Lee Hayward, and welcome to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Video Chat for Friday, June 17th. And the way these video chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here for the next hour or thereabouts, answering questions and topics of discussion that you may have when it comes to fitness and nutrition, building muscle, losing fat, any specific challenges that you're dealing with when it comes to your workouts or your eating plan. Feel free to type those questions and topics of discussion into our chat window, and I will do the best that I can to help you out over the course of our video chat today. And as you're logging in now, please let me know if this is coming through loud and clear. I always like to do a little audio video check to make sure. I mean, it looks good on my end, but I want to make sure it's coming uh, coming through loud and clear on your end because that's what's most important. Is to make sure that you can hear it. And we got Dan joining in. Dan is a regular. Welcome. And he's saying it is coming through loud and clear. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you for that. And as you log in today, please let me know where you're from. Let's see, what neck of the woods are you from as you're logging into our video chat? We got Lee Dunnigan joining in. Welcome, Lee. Lee's a regular to the chat from over in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. What part of the UK? I'm just curious. We got Daniel joining in from Spain. Welcome, Daniel. Nice to have you joining in. We've got Mike joining in from Indiana. Welcome to the chat today. And I'm in Newfoundland, Canada, in case you're wondering. <laughs> I'm sure the regulars know where I'm from, but if you are not familiar with me and my story, if you will, I'm from Newfoundland, Canada, and I've been online coaching in bodybuilding and fitness since the early days. Like the internet as we know it started back in 1996. That's when it became legal to basically have this public internet as we know it. And I started my website back in 1997. You know, so I've been around for quite a while, right? Before the days of YouTube, before the days of Google and all that stuff, before bodybuilding.com or any of the major sites, there was Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding, one of the original bodybuilding sites. So I've been at this for quite a while, and it's a passion project of mine, something that I truly love, you know, love helping people. I love the whole fitness lifestyle and just seeing people make progress. So uh, we got Neil joining in from over in the Philippines. Welcome. And it's saying it's good morning over there. Yeah, so I guess, what time is it over in the Philippines? That'd be interesting to know. Right now, it's 6.43 p.m. Newfoundland time for me. I was a little late starting. I normally start around 6.30, but I got, you know, carried away, <laughs> lost track of time. So I do apologize. I'm, I'm a few minutes late starting today. Got J.E. joining in saying give some thumbs up. I would appreciate it. Yeah, if you are enjoying these video chats, thumbs up. So again, how this works, guys, for those of you just logging on now, like I'm, I'm always stretching a little bit, right, to give some time for people to log on to the chat here. Uh, the way these chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here and answering questions and topics of discussion that you would like for me to cover. So if you do have anything related to fitness and nutrition, any questions about your workouts or your meal plans or any challenges that you're dealing with when it comes to building muscle or losing fat, um, you know, stuff along those lines. Anything fitness and nutrition related, feel free to type those questions and topics of discussion into our chat window today, and I'll do the best I can to help you out. Neil saying it is 5, 12 a.m. over in the Philippines. Wow, <laughs> that's an early one for you. Uh, we got Lee over in the UK, says he's from Southampton, which is the furthest place in south of England. We're right on the coast. Cool. I'm pretty close to the coast myself. Like when I look out the window, I can see the see the Atlantic Ocean. All right, we got Exam XL joining in. Gabriel's joining in, saying, "Hope you're doing good. Thanks for the live streams." Uh, how does a pull workout look for an athlete like me who trains very clean and control, but lacks lat size, especially lower lats? All right, good question. And we'll start off with that question of the day. That's from Gabriel. When it comes to your lat development, any muscle development for that matter, but we're going to focus specifically on the lat, seeing that as your question, genetics plays a huge role, right? Genetics is, is ultimately going to determine what kind of muscle shape and size and potential you have, right? So everybody's a bit unique with this. Some people have 
really high lats. Some people have wide lats that, you know, attach low on the waist, you know, have that lower lat flare. Uh, some people have bigger lats, smaller lats, thicker lats, you know, whatever. I mean, you're going to have all kinds of different shapes and sizes. But if you really want to prioritize that lower lat area, here's a, a killer strategy that works really well, is when you're doing rows and pull downs and, and a lot of your back exercises, use an underhand grip. And this is really good because when you use an underhand grip, like a lot of times people are using overhand grip, right? And that works great for the upper back. But when you use an underhand grip, now all of a sudden you, you rotate your arms downwards and you activate more of that lower lat area. So if you start doing rows with an underhand curl grip, the same grip you would use if you're doing bicep curls, right? Basically, that's the, the curl grip. Once you start using the curl grip, now you're going to activate that lower lat area. And this was a famous exercise, um, you know, using the underhand grip was famous uh, by Dorian Yates, right? He really took back development and bodybuilding to a whole new level back when he was competing in the mid 90s. And the thing that really separated him from the rest of the bodybuilders at the time was his back development, especially his lower back development. Like when he turned around and did a lat spread, it was like lights out for everybody because it was just this massive back from top to bottom and really thick in the lower lats. And that was his uh, flagship exercise was underhand grip rows. And he did a lot of underhand grip pull downs and underhand grip pullovers. Like he did a lot of underhand grip exercises in general. And that was something that really helped to thicken up that whole lower lat area. So if you are struggling with that lower lat size, I would recommend for the next six to eight weeks, do primarily lower lat, uh, you know, underhand grip uh, rowing, underhand grip pull downs, pull ups. Um, if you have a pullover machine, you know, something along the lines of the Nautilus pullover, you can even do that with an underhand grip. And that will really help to activate those lower lat area. So that's what I would recommend if you want to prioritize that. And the big thing when it comes to back is use slow and controlled form and really focus on feeling the muscles work. Like a lot of times when people do rowing exercises for the back, they end up heaving and jerking, using a lot of leg drive, a lot of momentum. And yeah, that's great for moving weight, but it's not necessarily great for maximum muscle activation. And, and I'll give you an, an analogy that'll make sense. Think of someone pulling over a lawnmower, right? I mean, they grab it and they use an explosive movement and they're probably using like a lot of swinging and momentum and, and in leg drive and everything else to, to pull that lawnmower over. But they're probably not actually feeling their back muscles contract, right? Like, yes, they're pulling over the lawnmower, but they're not feeling the muscles, you know, in that rowing motion, if you will. It's just everything else is getting worked. And you don't want to apply that principle when it comes to lifting weights. You want a slow and controlled muscular contraction and not just a heave and jerk like if you're trying to start a lawnmower, right? So slow down the tempo. If you can't feel the muscles working, either your form is off or the weight's too heavy, like lighten up the weight, slow down, and really focus on squeezing, contracting. So like as you're doing the rows, pull back, pull your elbows back, squeeze, flex, contract the lats, and then, and then let your arms come all the way out for a full stretch. So I always think of stretch and squeeze, stretch and squeeze with each repetition, and that'll really help to develop that mind-muscle connection and uh, maximize the development in the lats. And this is a hard area to get that mind-muscle connection because the back is out of sight, out of mind, right? You can't see it contracting, whereas most of your other body parts, especially the, the muscles on the front of the body, you can see them. Like if you're working your chest, right, you can look down and you can see your chest, right? If you're working your arms, you can look down and see your arms. If you're, you know, doing legs, you know, like leg extensions or something, you can look down and you can see your legs. Like if you can see the muscle, it's easier to get that mind-muscle connection because you can see it and, and it helps to, to develop that. But if you can't see it, like your back, you just got to go by feel. Uh, unless, well, I, actually, I can I can see my back because <laughs> so I'm in a mirror. But if, if you know what I mean, right? <laughs> Most people can't see their back, right? So if, if you can uh, see it, or sorry, if you can feel it and, and really try to get that mind-muscle connection, it'll help. All right, so... Hopefully that helped. And moving on now, 
Uh, we got Dario joining in, and Dario is a regular to these chats. I know he's done several Lose Your Gut challenges, and he always tunes into our video chats. Nice to have you back. Uh, he's asking, have I ever played any sports, tennis, basketball, or soccer? Uh, yes, I have. When I was younger, I'm talking like young, young, and like started at five years old, and throughout my like elementary school days, I was involved with a, a local soccer league. Now, I, I didn't take it seriously. Well, part of the reason was um, we moved away when I was, you know, in elementary school. We moved to a new town, new school, and everything else, and started over. And when I was in that transition, I didn't keep the soccer going. But when I was where I in my original house that I grew up in, uh, I was part of a local soccer league, and I played. I was a defenseman. I, I used to play left position defense. That was my position on the soccer field. I remember it. Uh, for basketball, I, I never played official basketball. I mean, just, just you know, high school and, and shooting the shit with my buddies and stuff like that. But I'm not a basketball player, right? I'm five foot six. So I certainly not going to excel at basketball. Tennis, I've never played tennis before. Uh, but I did do soccer, like I said. Now, in my case, after I got out of sports, we moved and you know, moved to a new town, went to a new school. One thing that happened to me back then was being the new kid at a new school and everything else, I was getting picked on by a lot of bullies, right? Because I didn't fit in. I wasn't one of the, the in kids, if you will. I was the new guy from out of town, blah, blah, blah. And I got picked on and bullied a lot when I was in school. And that's what motivated me to get started with martial arts, right? Because I was sick and tired of having the bullies pick on me and you know, push me around and everything else. And I wanted to be able to hold my own. So that's what led me to doing martial arts. So then for several years, all through elementary school and going through high school, I was involved with martial arts and at the time took it very seriously. Like, I mean, I was totally committed to doing that. And I re even remember like career day at school, they were like, oh, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a martial arts instructor, right? Like that's what I wanted to be. And my martial arts instructor at the time uh, I, I went through a different, a couple different clubs. So the first guy I went through and then I switched clubs and went to another club. But the guy who was at the, the other club, if you will, the, the, the latest club that I was at, he um, lifted weights. And he was the strongest guy that I knew personally. Now, you got to remember, this was back before the days of the internet and stuff. So you couldn't just Google search bodybuilders and strongmen and powerlifters and all that kind of stuff. So unless you knew somebody personally, you didn't know him, Right. So this, my martial arts instructor, he lifted weights and at the time he could bench press 300 pounds, which I thought was like the strongest man in the world. Cause I never knew was anybody who could bench press 300 pounds. And that just like blew my mind in terms of strength. So I started working out with him. You know, he had a, a home gym set up in his basement and, you know, some of the more advanced students would go over a couple times a week and lift weights with them. So in addition to training at the dojo, you know, a couple times a week, we go over and we lift weights in his basement a couple times a week. And that's where I really got bit by the, the, the bodybuilding weight training bug, if you will. And then he was noticing, you know, as the years were progressing, he said, Lee, you're taking more of a fondness to the weight training than you are to the martial arts. And, you know, he, he took me aside and he asked me, he said, like, what, what do you really want to focus on? Right. Cause he says, like, I, I'm not seeing the same drive and passion for the martial arts training, but I'm seeing a lot of drive and passion when it comes to the weight training. So he said, like, do you want to continue doing both or do you want to prioritize one or the other? What, like, what do you want to do? And I told him, I said, you know, I, I really like uh, the whole weight training. I'd like to start doing bodybuilding, you know, and powerlifting and stuff like that. And he said, well, if that's what you're passionate about, he said, do it right. Versus, you know, being torn between two different things. So I, I took his advice and I actually stopped doing martial arts at the time and I focused on bodybuilding and I competed the following year in our local provincial bodybuilding competition and that's where it all snowballed. That was back in 1995 when I competed and then I competed pretty much every year since in bodybuilding up until uh, 2011 is when I did my last show in a row, if you will, and then I took a 10-year hiatus and then just... Last year in 2021, I made a comeback to the Masters over 40 division at our local bodybuilding competition. So that's how my whole bodybuilding journey got started. I mean, it originally started with martial arts. And then my martial arts instructor was the one who got me involved with uh, 
got me more interested, I should say, in uh, weight training. And that really helped to spur things on. But that's that's how the whole journey got started, right? So it started by getting bullied in school, <laughs> right? Which led me to martial arts, which then led me to, you know, bodybuilding. All right. So a little trip down memory lane for us all. Uh, we got John joining in uh, saying, if you haven't recovered for the next workout doing the same muscle group, would... Would I be doing too many sets? Not necessarily. I mean, recovery is something that's very individual. And I'm going to explain how the whole recovery process works. Generally speaking, people who are new to exercise are going to have the hardest time recovering because your fitness level is low. Your work capacity is low. You don't have this, the strength and the stamina. So anything you do is going to create a lot of muscle soreness and aches and pains. And that's why you see people who, who sign up for the gym for the first time and they go through a workout, you know, they're, they're feeling it the next day. And they're probably feeling it for days afterwards. They get the delayed onset muscle soreness. But the more you work out and the more consistent you are and the better your fitness level gets, the faster the recovery process happens. So eventually you'll be able to get to the point where you do a workout and you don't really feel all that beat up the next day, right? You don't feel overly sore. Now, I mean, you'll probably still feel the fatigue of, of working out, but it's not the, the painful soreness uh, where you, you can't move the next day. It's not like that. The only time advanced lifters really get really sore is if they do something that their body is totally unaccustomed to, right? Either a totally different routine a total different level of intensity or, or volume or something like that. And when you do something that your body is like, like a total shock to the system, then you'll probably get sore afterwards and you'll need to take some extra time to recover. But generally speaking, when you're into a set routine and, and following a consistent plan, you're not going to get painfully sore. So you should be able to maintain an optimal level of frequency. Now, with that being said, you got to adjust things according to your body and your own work capacity. And everyone's different in this regard. You know, what's ideal for one person may not be ideal for someone else, right? I mean, you might get some young guy who's full of piss and vinegar and, <laughs> and got good fitness and he can work out six days a week. And then you might have somebody else who's 45 year old office worker and he can handle three workouts a week, right? I mean, and, and everything in between. So, I mean, it really depends on you, your fitness level, your work capacity and kind of figuring out, what you can handle and what you can handle consistently. And I always encourage my coaching students to start off conservative, right? Versus jumping into like a six day per week program and then having to scale it back. I would much rather you jump into a three day per week program, feel good and build up and, and progress. It's always feels nice to progress versus trying to do too much too soon, risking an injury and overtraining and then having to back off. So start off conservative and let it build up gradually over time. But in your situation, if you're still feeling sore, or like you worked out one day and now you've gone through your training cycle and it's time to train that same body part again and you don't feel like you're fully recovered, well, you, you have a couple options. I mean, you could do an active recovery day. You, well, and you could just take the day off, which is nothing wrong with that. Or you could do an active recovery day where you just kind of go through some easy uh, exercises where you're not really stressing yourself out. And I'm actually more of a fan of active recovery training. And this can take the many forms. It could be doing extra cardio. It could be doing uh, like a, a like total body workout. Um, it could be even other exercises like mobility work or yoga or something along those lines. But I personally like to work out frequently and then adjust the intensity of those workouts based on how I'm feeling. So if it's an active recovery day, you know, the, the workout may literally be just a, an easy cardio session, or maybe doing some cardio and stretching and mobility work, something along those lines. And then when you're feeling better, then you can get into your full on weight training program and pushing yourself with progressive overload and all that stuff. All right. I mean, I know it's it, like I'm, I'm really only scratching the surface when it comes to a lot of these questions. So like if, if there's anything here that you want to elaborate more on, feel free to reach out to me. Like you can send me an email personally or you can even book in for a strategy call and we can chat about it. If this is something that you need some extra help with, you know, and probably even discuss, you know, customized training and nutrition program if, if needed. But uh, my, my details are in the description below if you want to reach out to me. 
All right, we have Neil saying, I've been doing a six by six full body workout three times a week and sore after each workout. I'm no longer used to 20 second rest periods using lighter weights. Is this normal hypertrophy? All right, the six by six, the old Vince Gironda six by six, I'm assuming. We do six sets of six reps with 20 seconds rest in between. I, I believe I made a playlist, a YouTube playlist about that years ago. Um, and you're saying you're doing that three times a week, sore after each workout, and I'm no longer used to doing 20 second rest periods using lighter weights. Is this normal? Well, anytime you've... Like, like, I kind of piggyback off the question I just answered. You do a new routine, so you provide some unique muscle stimulation for your body. You're probably going to get sore afterwards. But as your body adapts to that training, the soreness is going to become less and less, and your work capacity is going to increase. And eventually, you'll get to the point where this is probably not going to cause as much soreness or as much fatigue as you build up your fitness level. And, and every program goes through this phase. Like Every program you follow is going to have – you try the new program, and then in trying that program, your body has to adapt in response to that stimulation. So you, you you adapt, and then you grow. In response to adapting, you're going to see some growth, progress. You know, you're going to get fitter. You're going to get stronger. You're going to gain some muscle. Whatever it is that you're, you're trying to achieve, you're going to see some growth. Eventually, you're going to hit a plateau. Like, that growth is not going to continue nonstop forever. It's not like you can do the same thing over and over and over again for for. 10, 20 years and still reap progress from it. Like eventually your body's going to adapt and plateau and then you're going to have to change it up again, you know, provide some unique muscle stimulation. So every program, adapt, grow, plateau, <laughs> adapt, grow, plateau. And, and every program is going to go through that. So you got to look at where you are in that phase, right? Like, are you in the early phases of the program where your body's still adapting to it, which it sounds like it is based on your question there? Or are you in the mid phase of the program where you've been following it for a while, you're starting to see the results and you're seeing the fruits of your labor and you're seeing the results, which is awesome. You know, you're, you're actually, you've been training and you're get, making progress, right? You're, you're getting bigger, you're getting stronger. You're, you're seeing the fruits of your labor, which is the coolest part. And then eventually you're going to get to the point where you're doing the same thing and it's like, it's not working anymore or worse. You're even going to start to lose some strength. Like maybe you did a certain exercise. Like, I don't know, you, you, you bench press, X amount of weight for, for 10 reps. And then now the next workout is like, man, I'm struggling to get nine reps. And then the workout after that, man, I'm struggling to get eight reps. It's like, I'm getting weaker. Like what the heck's on the go? I can't even match what I was doing. Once you start to get to the point where the strength plateaus or even starts to backslide, that's when you need to change things up. And usually the first change will probably be some sort of deload, like some sort of active recovery week to let your body rest and recover. And then you can change up the exercises or change up the routine to provide some unique muscle stimulation and start that whole adapt, grow, plateau all over again with a new routine. But that's generally how things work. So that's the, the normal hypertrophy process, if you will. Uh, Lee Dunnigan saying, do I have any tips for tennis elbow? I'm doing the usual rest and ice and I have a massage gun, which seems to help. You know, I got to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of ice for a lot of things. Like I, I rarely use ice on injuries and I've heard mixed reviews on it. Like some people swear by it and everything else, but I've never been one to use a lot of ice. Uh, but one thing that I will find helpful, especially for, for tennis elbow or things like that, compression. So if you can get some compression sleeves or, or compression elbow cuffs or something, to help support the, the joints, tendons, and ligaments around the elbow and the forearm there, that will help. And you can, even if you go on Amazon and look for them, like compression elbow sleeves and like a lot of powerlifting or, you know, fitness sites and stuff like that, you'll probably carry them as well. But they're very common amongst serious uh, weightlifters, bodybuilders, powerlifters, strongman, like any, anywhere would you, where you would get those type of fitness accessories. Like, you know, belts and gloves and wraps and straps and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you should be able to get the compression sleeves. And I think that's probably one of the best things that you can get. You know, so compression sleeves on your elbows that will help to provide support when you're doing your workouts. And it also helps to keep the joints and tendons and ligaments more, right? Anytime you have any injury, you want to keep that area covered, whether it is with a compression sleeve or even just wearing 
like long sleeve shirt, long, you know, long track pants and stuff like that. Like don't go for prime example. Like if you got elbow pain or shoulder pain or something like that, don't go to the gym with tank top on. Right. And then have those uh, sore and fragile joints cold. Right. I'd rather you be covered up and warm and build up heat because heat is going to help with that. Right. So, I mean, if, if I have any elbow pain, I'm having those elbows wrapped, whether it's with the sleeves and probably even putting on like a, a sweatshirt or a hoodie as well to help hold in some body heat there. Because the, the warmer you can keep it, uh, the less risk of injury there's going to be. Uh, another thing that is a big thing when it comes to working around any aches or pains or injuries is if any particular exercises hurts, causes pain or discomfort, don't do it. <laughs> Find another variation instead. And you'd be surprised when it comes to working around tennis elbow, like sometimes the simplest thing will allow you to do a movement pattern. Like, for example, like maybe you can't do bicep curls because it causes too much pain, but you could do hammer curls. So instead of having your hands in a curl position, you switch them to a hammer curl position. Now, all of a sudden, you might be able to do the exercise or vice versa. You know, maybe you can't use a straight bar, but you could use an easy curl bar. Or maybe you can't use a barbell, but you can use like a low pulley cable. Or you might be able to use a resistance band. Like sometimes just changing it up ever so slightly will allow you to just switch the way the tension is placed on those joints, tendons, and ligaments. And it'll allow you to work around it. So that's something you, you can experiment with. Like all the, the exercises that are causing you aches and pains and discomfort, just go really light and see if there are some other variations of those exercises that you can do instead. Like instead of doing uh, like a, a free weight bench press, maybe you could do like a, a seated chest press machine or, or something along those lines. And, and generally speaking, machines, cables, you know, resistance bands, are probably going to be easier and more therapeutic on the joints, tendons, and ligaments versus free weights. And I, anytime I'm working around injuries, I like machines because they're going to balance and support the weight for you. And all you have to do is push or pull against resistance. Whereas with free weights, you got to balance and support and stabilize. And if you got any joint, tendon, or ligament issues, uh, you, you could easily hurt yourself, right? Like even just getting yourself into position like on racking a barbell from a bench press, or if you're doing dumbbell presses, like kicking the dumbbells up into position, like that could cause a lot of stress on those joints, tendons, and ligaments in the elbow. Whereas if you use a chest press machine, like maybe a hammer strength or some plate loaded machine or weight stack machine, whatever, it's, it's already in position. You just got to literally exert and push and pull against resistance. Like the balance and stabilization is taken care of by the machine. So there's less risk of you injuring yourself or throwing yourself out of position because it's it's on a fixed path it's stabilized it's, it's very safe and secure in that sense so you know machines have their place i know like a lot of people do the whole machine versus free weight debate and stuff like that and it depends it depends on the situation right in some situations as in this working around injuries machines are superior you know if, if you're trying to maximize you know, functional strength and and you know, pure raw power. Well, okay. Free weights are, you know, more beneficial, but you gotta, you gotta look at the pros and cons of both and the situation you're going through. So try the best that you can to work around those, uh, uh, with exercises that don't place stress on those tendons and ligaments. And another cool thing when it comes to machine exercises as well, is you're not lifting the weights to load it. Like if you're using like a weight stack machine, you don't have to be loading the 45 pound plates, uh, on the you know on, on the barbells and, and stuff like that and that sometimes aggravates tennis elbow i remember back when my tennis elbow was flared up one of the hardest things i found was just literally picking up weight plates and putting it on the barbell like loading that that was one of the, just the the movement of, of picking up the weight and i had to get comfortable like grabbing it with the other side and like trying to pick it up in a such a way that i didn't strain the the tennis elbow but simple stuff like that, just picking up dumbbells and picking up weight plates can sometimes aggravate it. So if you're using machine exercises, you don't need to be picking up, you know, free weights. So that's one less thing that you have to, that could potentially strain that uh, tennis elbow. So the, the big thing is avoid aggravating the injury any further so that it can heal on its own. And it will take some time, but it will heal on its own. And there are some different rehab exercises that you can do. I mean, I, I made some videos. They're older ones up on my YouTube channel. But if you just do a search for like Lee Hayward elbow tendonitis or Lee Hayward tennis elbow, you should see some videos that I made 
uh, covering some strategies and some rehab exercises that you can do for them. All right, what else we got there? Um, Robert's joining in. He says, when doing calf raises, should I do more reps than trying to increase the weight? Not necessarily. Focus on the quality of the reps and the quality of the movement more than weight and just the number of reps. And think of time under tension. That's, that's what you want to focus on. So I'm going to give you an example. When I do calf raises, I, I don't just pump out reps. You, know, like you see a lot of guys, they'll, they'll get on the calf raise machine and they're just doing these little short choppy reps bouncing up and down in the mid-range. When I do calf raises, I'll first make sure that my feet are solid and secure on the foot plate. And then I'll let my heel sink all the way down. Get a full stretch in the bottom. So I let the heel sink all the way down. Hold that for a second or two. And then come all the way up onto the balls of my feet, all the way up onto my tippy toes, squeeze the calves hard, hold that for a second or two, and then repeat. So stretch, hold, then come all the way up, peak contraction, hold. And I just really emphasize that. And it's not just banging out reps. You know, I'm not in the mid-range, just pump, 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 like these little short, pulsy reps. And I find that that is the best way to stimulate growth in the calves because the calves, one, they're a very tough and dense muscle group. And they're used to doing a lot of repetitions in that mid range. Like every time you walk, every time you take a step, climb a flight of stairs and move around, you're doing a lot of repetitions in that mid range, never fully stretching, never fully peak contraction. So if you want to stimulate growth and provide that unique muscle stimulation, you got to get outside that high volume mid range. So full stretch, full peak contraction and emphasize that. And the weight is going to be determined by how well you can handle that fully stretch and that fully peak contraction. So I, I'm not a, I, I'm not a, one of these ego lifters where like, oh, I got to use the whole weight stack on the calf raise machine, right? You know, because for some reason, <laughs> as, as weird as it is, the calf raise is one of those ego exercises. Like a lot of people try to go way too heavy, right? And a lot of times the people who go way too heavy have the skinniest calves, <laughs> right? Like I, I use a moderate weight. Like it's, it's, I don't go crazy. I don't have any ego or emotional attachment to it. Like, I don't care if I'm using like a hundred pounds on the weight stack. Right. You know, and then I see some, you know, chicken leg teenager putting like two or 300 pounds on the weight stack. Like, dude, I, I got the calves. You don't <laughs> right? like uh, use form. You use, use my, my muscle connection, quality form and focus on that stretch and that peak contraction. And as far as the repetitions, I, I mean, yeah, you can probably shoot for like sets of 10 or somewhere around there, but don't get hung up on the reps. It's the quality of the reps. Like, I don't care how many reps you do. I mean, if, if they all suck, then they're not as effective. I'd rather you do fewer reps and good quality reps and actually feel the muscles work, feel them stretch, feel them contract and get that connection and, and muscle stimulation. So don't get hung up on the numbers, focus on the quality of the movement and then just progress from there. So Whatever it is that you got to start with, I mean, assuming it's lightweight and low reps, that's fine. Start with lightweight and low reps. Focus on good quality form, feeling the muscles, stretch and contract with each repetition, and then just do better than you did before for each workout thereafter, right? Either add some repetitions, add some weight, you know, some form of measurable progressive overload over time. And that's the secret. I mean, that will start to spur on some new growth in the calves. All right. And another thing I should mention too, if you really want to maximize your calf development, you want to do a straight leg calf raise as well as a bent leg calf raise. So, you know, the typical standing calf raise and seated calf raise, that would allow you to work the major areas of the calves. All right, moving on. All right, Gabriel is saying thank you. You're welcome. Um, John is saying thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, would 12 sets be enough on a large muscle group and 10 sets on a smaller muscle group? That really depends on your fitness level, how hard you're doing the sets and everything else. Like don't, again, don't get hung up on the number, focus on the quality and actually the muscle stimulation, right? Like in my case, I don't do anywhere near that many. Like I usually do one, I do total body workouts for the most part. So I usually pick one exercise for each muscle group. And uh, probably do anywhere from three to five sets. So, I mean, a typical workout, I'm literally doing three to five sets per muscle group. 
but I'm doing it frequently, you know, at least a few times a week. So don't get hung up on all these rules. Like people say, oh, you know, 12 sets for big muscle groups and 10 sets for smaller muscle groups and, you know, 15 sets if you're trying to do this. And like, no, it's, it's just focus on what's right for you. I mean, and again, start conservative, right? Just focus on the quality and then improve, right? Whether you're adding extra repetition, adding extra weight, or if you have to add extra sets to, I mean, some form of progressive overload. And all these are acceptable forms of progressive overload, either adding repetitions, adding weight, or adding sets in terms of volume, right? So it, it's not like there, there's a rule like, oh, I, if, if I got to do 12 sets and it's productive, or if I do 11 sets, it's not productive. No, it's all muscle stimulation, right? Just focus on being good enough and good enough consistently and progressing over time, being better than you were before. All right, we have Lewis joining in. And he's saying, what kind of routine do you recommend for a young kid of 14 years old for the first time training? I actually have um, some beginner workout programs up on my YouTube channel that you can follow along with to kind of get an idea. But the best thing that I would actually recommend for a 14-year-old, work out with someone who's more experienced and get them to show you the ropes. And very often, if you go to any personal or any trainer at the gym, like most mainstream gyms are going to have some sort of beginner's program or circuit or something like that that they take people through. Get one of the trainers or coaches to take you through that and show you how to do all the basic exercises of their particular beginner circuit routine, whatever it is that they have. And it's going to vary from gym to gym based on the equipment they have available. Like, um, like I know uh, one gym that I train at, Platinum Fitness, they've got a workout routine that they have based on, you know, the equipment that they have there, right? And it's just, it's going to vary from gym to gym. But if you go in there, I mean, they can set you up on a basic beginner's training plan. And that's a great place to start. And don't overthink it. Like the, the most important thing for someone who's just getting started is to literally just get started. Like don't overthink it. Just show up. 80% of success is showing up, right? And a lot of people, they they get hung up in this whole uh, paralysis by analysis. And then they overthink it. And then they're delaying starting. Like just don't overthink it. Just show up and start and then get one of the trainers or one of the advanced members or somebody to take you through and show you how to use all the pieces of equipment. Like, I, I would much rather you have someone experienced take you through the gym and show you what to do versus just showing up as a total newbie with deer in the headlights and like, I don't know what the frick I'm doing here, <laughs> right? And like, you using the machines wrong and then not knowing how the heck to do it. Like, have someone coach you, whether you hire a trainer or, or you got someone who's more experienced who can help you. Uh, in my case, I mean, I was kind of fortunate in this because um, my my dad helped me get started early on, you know, because he he used to work out at the gym back in the day. So, I mean, he, he knew the basics and helped me. And uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, my martial arts instructor, right? He took me under his wing and taught me how to lift weights. So, I mean, having somebody as a mentor who can show you is going to make a huge difference versus just you going in there and floundering around on your own trying to figure it out. Right. It makes a huge difference to have someone there in person. But in the meantime, head on over to my main YouTube channel, the Total Fitness Bodybuilding channel. Uh, in the playlist tab, there's there's a beginner's playlist series. There's a whole bunch of different ones there. And watch those videos. And that'll kind of like give you the, the mindset and, you know, kind of give you the, the visuals of, OK, what, what are the different exercises at the gym? This is the kind of things I can expect. This is the kind of stuff that I should be doing. And that'll just help to lay the foundation. But then when you actually get to the gym, get someone there to, to literally take you by the hand and, and go through a workout with you in real time. And do that for, for maybe in the first couple of weeks, you know, or at least the first week, just to get your feet wet, just to get comfortable. And after you've gone through that initiation phase, you'll probably be able to do it on your own for a while, right? But at least get someone to, sh to show you the ropes initially. All right. What else we got there? Uh, Neil saying, thank you so much. He says, more power to you. Have a great day. You're welcome. Glad to be of service. We have Raj saying, he's from India. He's been a fan since 2010. Much respect. Thanks for uh, 
Thanks for the support over the years. Glad to have you tuning in. We have Andre joining in. Saying, Lee, why do you think about pull-ups? I love doing them, but they are so challenging. Are they worth keeping in my back routine? Yes, pull-ups are a phenomenal exercise. They're one of the best back exercises you can do, but they are a hard exercise. So you have a few variations. Um, first off, if you can do proper pull-ups, do proper pull-ups. If you're not strong enough to do pull-ups yet, then you can do some beginner variations. And I actually have a full video showing, it's called How to Do Pull-Ups for Beginners. So if you do a YouTube search for Lee Hayward, How to Do Pull-Ups for Beginners, that video will pop up and I'll take you through a whole progressive pull-up series of things that you can do to build up to doing your first proper pull-up. So that would be a great place to start. But if you're strong enough to do them now, like even if you can just do a few reps, right, like do them. And what I would recommend, this is one of the best strategies for getting good at doing pull-ups, multiple sets of low reps. So instead of going and grabbing the pull-up bar and trying to rep out to failure and see how many you can bang out in a single set and, and rep to exhaustion, just do a couple reps and stop. Like prime example, let's say you can do five reps to failure right now. Well, instead of grabbing the pull-up bar and, and doing five reps and then on that fifth rep, you're struggling to get yourself over the bar, don't do it. Like literally go in there and do two reps. Instead of one set to failure of five, do five sets of two. Like those two reps, if, if you, you should be able to bang those out relatively easy. I mean, it's not going to be max effort, but it's going to be challenging. But literally try to do multiple sets of low reps. So let's just say, again, you did five sets of two. Okay, that's 10 total reps over the course of the workout. And then you can try and improve on that. Like maybe you either increase the set or increase the repetitions, but just slowly build it up over time, doing multiple sets of low reps. And that is a phenomenal strategy to build up your pull-up strength. And, and how you would do these pull-ups is, is don't just stay at the pull-up bar and bang out set after set after set. Literally space them out throughout your workout. So as your first exercise after you've warmed up, go over to the pull-up bar and do a couple pull-ups. And then do a back exercise. Maybe you, you go and do some deadlifts or rows or whatever. And then after that, go over to the pull-up bar and do a couple pull-ups. And then go do your next back exercise. Maybe it's some... I don't know, whatever it is, cable rows or dumbbell rows or whatever exercise you got on your agenda. Then after you finish that exercise, go over and do a couple more pull-ups. And then like just space it out. In between each exercise, do a couple pull-ups. And then over the course of the workout, you can get you know five or more sets of pull-ups done. And it won't feel as exhausting, but you're still getting that volume of training. And that volume of training is going to accumulate over time. And another strategy is you can do pull-ups on non-back day as well, right? Like if this is something that you want to prioritize, you can even do it on other body part days. Like it doesn't always have to be back day that you do pull-ups, right? You can throw them in on a chest day or a leg day or whatever. Just literally go over to the pull-up bar, do a couple pull-ups, then go on do your next exercise. And by spacing it out like this and doing them more frequently, that volume is going to accumulate and you're going to see the results start to, to happen faster and faster. And it, it's it's not going to be instantaneous. It's not like you're going to do this for a workout or two. And the next thing you know, you're, you're Superman can bang out pull-ups. But it's going to compound. And over the course of like several weeks and then several months and then over the course of a year, it's going to be like, holy shit, like look at the progress you made. You went from sucking at doing pull-ups to now you can bang them out with ease. Like that's, that's the timeline. Like you're looking at <sighs> at least three months of doing this consistently before you're really going to start to reap the results. And then after a year of doing this consistently, you're going to be one of those guys where people are like, holy shit, he's really good at pull-ups. And one of my coaching students, Jeff Samatero, he used this strategy, right, of, of, in his own training. And I, I lost count of where he's at now, but I, he can do over 20 consecutive pull-ups, good, strict pull-ups. Uh, I I'm not sure if, if Jeff, if you're tuning in, watching this right now, let me know how many pull-ups you can do. <laughs> Type it into the chat window. Uh, but he, he, I know he's done 20 and I think he's even surpassed that now. And like, these are solid pull-ups. Like he's posted videos and stuff online showing them. I mean, that's not these CrossFit kipping pull-ups where you look like a fish flopping out of water, or trying to do some like gymnastic swing over the bar. Like I'm talking like strict controlled pull-ups right? A muscular contraction, not just heaving and momentum and heaving and jerking. So yeah, th this strategy works, but multiple sets 
uh, of low reps and let the volume compound over time. And that's that's the secret to getting better at them. Nice. That's one uh, that strategy of multiple sets of low reps. I should give credit where credit is due. That's one of the strategies I, I learned from the late Charles Poliquin, who uh, is no longer with us, but he was a, a genius when it comes to uh, fitness and strength and conditioning. Uh, who else we got? Mark is joining in saying no pain, no gain. <laughs> All right. I, I like to get some gain. I don't really like the pain, but <laughs> I appreciate the comment. Right. I, I like to get the gain without, uh, while well, still enjoying the process. Right. And of course there's going to be some pain, but, uh, you know, we use that in t take it with a grain of salt. Right. If, if something hurts, you probably shouldn't do it. Uh, we got Steven joining in. Uh, it says, uh, I asked a guy if upright rows with a rope ever bothered his shoulders. He said it was like SM, SH, SMH. All right. Um, upright rows bother your, with a rope bother your shoulders. Some people, I, 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 I'm not sure what the, if he's directing this question at me or if he's commenting to somebody else, but I'm just going to share my two cents on the upright row because it's a controversial exercise. It's one of those movements. Some people will go online and like, Oh, you know, the top five worst exercises you should never do. And the upright row is on that list. Like it depends on the individual. Like if you can do the exercise, you enjoy it, you feel it works for you, then do it. <laughs> if you don't like the exercise, it doesn't feel right. Or you don't get a pump from it or it doesn't, then don't do it. Like not every exercise will work for everybody. We all have our own unique structures and mobility issues and, and flexibility and all that kind of stuff. And are, we're at different phases of development. And sometimes, you know, in the early phases of your training, you might not get much of a benefit from an exercise. But then as you fill out your frame and add more size and muscle mass, you may get more benefit from an exercise. I mean, that, that was the case with me when it came to um, dumbbell flies. I remember back in my early days as a beginner, I would do dumbbell flies and I never felt anything. I just feel a strain on the shoulders, joints, tendons, and ligaments. But then after I, you know, several years of training and I actually built some muscle in my chest. Now when I do a dumbbell fly, I'm like, oh, I'm actually stretching some muscle here now, not just working joints, tendons, and ligaments. So as your body develops and, and evolves, so will, so will your ability to do certain exercises or the response you get from those exercises will also evolve. So when it comes to upright rows, if you like them and they work for you, more power to you. Now, in my case, I actually like them using dumbbells. I find upright rows with dumbbells where you have that freedom of movement with your hand position and you're not locked into a rigid uh, plane of motion like you are with a barbell. I actually find it quite comfortable and quite beneficial. So I get a really good pump when I do upright rows with dumbbells like that. But again, that's that works for me. It may not work for everybody. Uh, what martial arts did you practice when I was, what led me to lifting? I started off with Shaolin Kung Fu. There was a Shaolin Kung Fu club, and that's what I did when I was going through, started in elementary school, and then uh, throughout high school I did it. In more recent years, I did some, like back in the early 2000s, uh, I got back into it for a little while, and I did about a year of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I did some boxing and a little bit of MMA. I mean, I, I didn't get in the ring and fight. I just did the training and the sparring and stuff like that. But I did that for a while. Um, and I enjoyed it. I got to say, it was a nice change of pace. But I was getting a lot of injuries, especially from the jujitsu. Anybody who's ever done jujitsu, you, like you're getting in all these submissions and arm bars and, you know, kimuras and all these weird holds. And it was just you know, talking about like elbow tendonitis and, and, and stuff like that. I was always getting aches and pains just from going through all the submissions. And then it finally got to the point. It was like, man, it ain't worth it. <laughs> what, what was the final um, thing that, that stopped me from, from martial arts from doing the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and stuff is we were doing takedowns from standing. And I, I you know, one of the guys we were doing some drills and then I came down hard on my knee and just the way that I hit my knee, I damaged some some cartilage in my knee joint and it took weeks or months even to, to heal that. And once that happened, like, I mean, I couldn't participate in, in the, you know, the club 
to the same. And I was even in the gym trying to rehab it for months. So while I was taking some time off from that, and I finally did rehab that knee injury, I was like, do I really want to go back to this? Like, I have no, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be a UFC fighter. I'm not going to get in the ring or, or anything like that. I'm just doing it for, for sport and for fun, but I'm getting the shit beat out of me all the time. Now, not literally, but I mean like aches and pains, you know, cause oh, now my shoulder's hurting because I got in a submission or I, you know, my elbow is hurting cause I got in an arm bar and, and all this. No, but now my knees are hurting because I landed the wrong way on a takedown. And I was, I was always getting aches and pains and it's not always my fault. <laughs> Right. Like if I get hurt in the gym, well, it's my own damn fault because I, I usually I lifted too heavy or I used poor form or I didn't warm up properly or, you know, like you're in control of what you do in the gym. But when you're sparring with somebody and, you know, you're doing martial arts, you're not in control. Right. Like you're you're putty in your opponent's hand sometimes. And uh, that was the case with me. And I just got to the point where, like, it's not worth it anymore. So I said, like, you know, I, I respect the guys and everything else who were doing it. But I just said, like, I don't want to be beat up all the time, right? So I just decided then to stick to stuff that I'm in control of, which is the, you know, working out at the gym and doing my own thing that way. So I that's when I put the put a hold on martial arts. You know. Well, like I say, I, I do respect it and I did get a lot of benefit from it over the years. But like I say, it's one of those sports where you know you'd you can get beat up from it. <laughs> and like I got to the point where I didn't want to get beat up anymore. Uh, what else we got there? Thoughts on a pullover machine for chest versus oats. I think you mean lats, and it just happened to come out as oats because the L and the O are very close on the keyboard. All right. <laughs> that one's from Mark. Uh, the pullovers, whether it's done on a machine or free weights, it is going to work the chest. It is going to work the lats. It's basically going to work like all the muscles of your torso. It's a stretching exercise. So like as you extend, you're going to feel your chest stretch. You're going to feel your lat stretch. You're going to feel your abs stretch and all your obliques and serratus and all the muscles of, you know, throughout your torso and that is going to stretch. So it's, it's a compound stretching exercise is what it is. Like a lot of people try and argue back and forth. Oh, it's not a chest exercise. It's a lat exercise. No, it's not a lat exercise. It's a chest exercise. It's like, dude, it's a stretch your freaking body exercise. <laughs> So you're going to stretch the chest, the lats, the abs, the serratus, the, the, the rib cage, the obliques, you know, like all the muscles of your torso are going to get stretched when you do the pullover. Your triceps, your biceps, like your shoulders, everything's getting stretched. And I mean, that, that applies to a lot of exercise. Like there's really no such thing as an isolation exercise because anytime you do any exercise, multiple muscle groups, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of muscles come into play as balance and stabilizer muscles. Like even if you stand up to do a bicep curl, well, all the muscles from your feet to your ankles and your legs and your core and your back and everything else has to come into play just to stand up. And then you're actually doing the bicep curl, which is what you're trying to focus on. But like there, there's dozens upon dozens of muscles that come into play just to stand up to do a bicep curl. So people think, oh, it's just an isolation exercise. You're only working your biceps. No, you're working a lot of stuff, all right? Same with, with any exercise. The, there's, there's truly no isolation exercise. So in the case of the pullover, you're hitting your chest, you're hitting your back, you're hitting it all. <laughs> right? And I love it. That's a, that's a good, that's one of my favorite exercises, especially if you got a good pullover machine. And my personal favorite, they're pretty rare, but it's the Nautilus pullover machine. And I'm, we're very fortunate that we have one at the gym that I train at. It's the old school Nautilus pullover, right? Like, it's it's similar to like the old one that you see Dorian Yates use in his videos from back in the day. And I mean, the, the original Nautilus equipment, like it was ahead of its time when it came to machines. Like the stuff was built to last, right? The, the, I've said this before, but it's, it's not cables and pulleys. It's chains and sprockets. Like there's big old sprockets like you'd see on a, a motorcycle, right? Like, and heavy chains, like it's, it's not like thin sprockets and thin chains, like you'd see on a bicycle. I'm talking like heavy freaking chains, just like something taken off a motorcycle. And that's what the thing runs on, right? You know, that's where the, the resistance is all hooked up with chains and sprockets. So, I mean, like it's never going to break. It's not like, you know, a cable pulley machine where like after so long, the cable snaps, like these chains are not snapping, right? It ain't happening. They're built to last. They're tough as nails. And like the one that we've got uh, at the gym, 
I, again, I have no idea how old it is, but I'm guessing it must be 30 or 40 years old at least because that's just the age bracket of those machines. And the thing is smooth and solid. I mean, it's, it's like it's like new, even though it's really old. Right. I mean, again, those machines were ahead of their time. So if you got access to them, by all means, use them. But with that being said, there are a lot of more modern machines that offer pullovers. I still don't think they're as good as the old Nautilus, but they'll get the job done. All right. What else we got there? Who else is joining in? We have the Muscle Monk. <laughs> Gotta love the username. He says, good morning. It's 3 a.m. here in India. Oh, uh, dude, what are you doing at 3 a.m.? Well, it's watching me, of course. I know that, but man. I don't know if I should be respecting you for getting up so early or telling you to go back to bed and get your Z's. But anyway, I'm going to answer your question, seeing you're up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, what's your whole contest prep strategy from six months out till the day you step on stage? My God, man, that's 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 a long-winded question, if there ever was one, or be a long-winded answer, I should say. I literally wrote a book outlining that. You know, it's called your first bodybuilding competition. And it, it exactly starts and, and states, you know, what I do from six months out up to the day of the show. And it's over a hundred page ebook. So I'm not going to read it out to you <laughs> on this channel, but I tell you what I will do. If you want a copy of it, send me an email to lee at leehayward.com and I'll forward you a copy of it, right? I'll do that. I'll do that at a goodwill, seeing you're up at 3 a.m. So all you got to do is you got to email me at lee at leehayward.com and say, hey, I'm the muscle monk who was up at 3 o'clock in the morning watching you, and I asked about your bodybuilding contest prep strategy. And I will literally send you a copy of that. As kudos for you for being up in the wee hours of the morning supporting the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. And that will answer your question for you. There. All right, moving on, we have RC Cosplay. He says, I'm away from my home gym. I'm doing pull-ups and dips at the park now. If only I could do shoulders, what do you recommend? Resistance bands. And if you're training at the park, resistance bands are awesome because you can hook them around the machines or the, the monkey bars or whatever you got at, at the park. And you can do a literally a total body workout because you can use your pull-ups and the dips and stuff to get the, the chest in the back. And then you can do the resistance bands. So you can do curls and rows and lateral raises and shoulder presses. And like you can literally hit all your major muscle groups using resistance bands. And you just got to get creative with them. And I've posted some videos showing total body workouts using resistance bands. And in fact, um, do a search for Lee Hayward bodybuilding from home. I think that's the name of the video, or it should pop up in the search results. Because back when the pandemic started, I put out a whole series of videos showing total body and, and body part workouts using resistance bands. Because, you know, if, as you recall, when the pandemic started, everything shut down and nobody was going to the gym. So, I mean, and I did it as a benefit to my coaching students at the time because everybody was going into panic mode. Like, oh, my God, the, the, you know, the, the sky is falling and the earth and the world is closing down. Like, what do we do? So I came up with a whole series of resistance band and body weight workouts that you could still make progress from home with minimal equipment. So, yeah, that would certainly help you in this situation. But do a search for Lee Hayward bodybuilding from home. I, th I think that's the name of the title or if not, it should pop up in the search results and you should see it there. But that covers a whole bunch of different resistance band exercises that you can do whether you're at home or whether you're at the park and still hit all your major muscle groups. All right. Nicholas is joining in. Nicholas is new to the whole Muscle After 40 program. And I was actually chatting to Nicholas today during a coaching call. Nice to have you joining in. He says, the calf raise machine is really good for quality reps, in my opinion. And I totally agree with you. I like the calf raise machine as well. It's my personal favorite when it comes to calf raises. I like the standing as well as the seated. Uh, you know, both have their advantages. Uh, we got... Doo -doo -doo. How are some people still breaking PRs when they're three weeks or a week out from a contest? Um 
I'm assuming you mean a bodybuilding contest. That's it. <laughs> How most people, and I'll just share my my feedback on this. If you are truly in bodybuilding contest shape, three weeks or a week out, you're not going to be able to set personal records. Like you're not going to hit a one rep max bench press or a one rep max deadlift squat or any one rep max PR and anything. If you're truly in shape, people who are hitting records, they're not fully dieted down, <laughs> meaning, uh, or they're just a genetic freak, right? Like there's, there's sometimes you can just chalk it up to man. Like they're just a genetic freak. Like maybe they're doing it in spite of it, not because of it. All right. And, and this is something you got to look at too when you, and this applies to a lot of things. Like a lot of times people will look at someone and say, you know, holy smokes, like Joe Blow, he goes drinking every weekend and the guy's in awesome shape. Like, how does he do that? Well, maybe he's in awesome shape despite the fact that he goes drinking every weekend, not because the fact that he goes drinking every weekend. Like, you know, sometimes people are doing something and still getting results despite the fact of whatever it is. Like you, a prime example, like, uh, sometimes you'll see bodybuilders who smoke cigarettes and they're in awesome shape. Like, especially you see a lot of European bodybuilders who smoke cigarettes and people say like, how, how, like, isn't smoking cigarettes bad for you? Like, how is he in such good shape, even though he smokes cigarettes? Well, maybe he's in good shape because of all the other stuff that he's doing. And this is just like a, a little vice that he has, right? I mean, it's certainly not helping, but he's doing enough positive things over here to overcompensate for that. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's not like, oh, this this guy smokes cigarettes and he's in awesome shape. Maybe I should start smoking cigarettes and I'll get in awesome shape, too. Like, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> so sometimes people get results despite of something, not because of something. So if you're seeing someone who's hitting a personal best and all like that, and they're in my opinion, they're they're not peaked for the contest. If if they if they're still hitting strength gains, they got more body fat to lose. So, you know, you know, that, that's my personal opinion. But if uh, let's assume, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt, they're lean and, and sh ripped and striated and, and like on target for, for coming in at their absolute peak for a contest and they're still hitting personal records, then man, that's, that's, that's a genetic freak of nature, right? It's, it's certainly not the norm because even with top level pro bodybuilders and Olympia competitors, like they're not in their hitting one rep max bench presses and stuff like that, you know, in the week before a contest. Yeah. At the week before a contest, they're in, <laughs> they're, they're just peaking for the show. Like they're, they're, the training is done by that stage. Like you're not building new muscle or setting new strength gains, like in the weeks leading up to a contest, right? You're just trying to maximize your conditioning to the best of your ability. But anyway, again, I don't, I don't know the people you're talking to, so I can't really uh, address it in any more detail than that. So moving on, we got Andre joining in. He says, Lee, one more quick question. There's always one more question. One more question. Which is more beneficial for cardio, jump rope or running? <laughs> neither. <laughs> I don't jump rope and I don't do running either. Um, the, what's most beneficial for cardio? The one that you can do consistently and that you enjoy, all right? It's it's there is no best cardio. Like if if you enjoy jumping rope and it works for you, then go for it. The only thing jumping rope is very intense. So like that's not long duration fat burning cardio. That's more high intensity cardio. Same with running, right? Unless you're going for a, an easy jog, uh, running is very high intense and, and very hard on the body. Like. Yeah, like it's it's one of those cardio form, both actually running and jumping rope. It's it's a lot of impact on the body, a lot of impact on the joints, tendons, and ligaments. So you got to look at like what are you doing the cardio for? If it's for fat loss and you're overweight and you're trying to lose weight and get in shape, I would not recommend any overweight person go jumping rope and doing running. Start with walking, like something low impact, or go to the gym and use the cardio machines there, or Go for a bicycle ride. Like my personal favorite form of cardio is bicycle riding. I do a lot of it. And one, I love it because it's fun. Uh, but it's 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 great cardiovascular exercise, but it doesn't beat up your body. Like there's very little strain on the joints, tendons, and ligaments. You're not getting impact. Uh, you know, it's something that you can do for long durations, that you can do consistently, and low risk of injury. 
unless you wipe out. <laughs> All right. But assuming you're a good rider and you got decent bike handling skills and you, you know, you keep the rubber side down and all that, it, it's it's relatively safe. Whereas running, there's a lot of impact. Right? I mean, you see here runners like they're they're having foot and ankle and shin splints and knee and, and hip problems because of all that impact. You know, every time you take a step and, and stride when you're running, there's literally six times your body weight. Is is it don't quote me on this. I'm not sure if it's three times or six times your body weight. I'll have to look it up in the statistics. But bottom line, there's multiple times your body weight of impact every time you take a stride. Because, you know, when you come off the ground and you land each time, right, like there's a lot of impact. It's not just your body weight because you got the force and the velocity each time you take a stride. So it's multiple times your body weight in impact. So like if you're a couple hundred pounds, like there's 600 plus pounds or more and every time you take a stride, every time you take, the, you know, your foot hits the ground, that's a lot of force. And you do that repetitively over and over and over again, you know, it, it creates a lot of uh, strain on the body. And like I, I do a cycling is my main thing. And a lot of the guys that I ride with, some of them are triathletes. So they run, they swim, they cycle. And when we're chatting about training and stuff, a lot of them say the running is the hardest part, right? They get more beat up from the running than they do from anything else, right? So, I mean, I'm not a fan of running. Now, with that being said, if, if anybody's watching this and you're a runner and you love running and it's working for you, don't let the fact that Lee said he doesn't like running stop you from running, right? If you enjoy it and it's working for you, hey, by all means, keep going. I'm just sharing my feedback and my opinion, and I don't recommend running for people who are overweight. Like, that's something you should do when you're already at your ideal weight. But to get there, I would recommend other forms, more low impact, more gentler forms of cardio that you can do and sustain with less risk of injury. All right, moving on. We got Mike saying, what are your go-to foods for cookouts? I love to grill. I love to smoke meats in the summer. And I grill veggies sometimes too. Those all sound good. <laughs> um, I, I mean, if, if I'm going to have a... A barbecue, probably going to be some sort of steak or chicken or fish, or sometimes we'll get some lean sausages. Sometimes we'll get some fatty sausages and fatty burgers. Like sometimes it'll be a full on cheat meal. Like uh, I'll be honest, a barbecue for me is is not a regular thing. It's like I don't do it multiple times a week. It's it's kind of like you know a couple times a month or so. So sometimes it might be a cheat meal barbecue where it's hot dogs and sausages and hamburgers and, you know, and, and juicy, you know, T-bone steaks, right? And I mean, that's not diet food, if you will. That's that's kind of like cheat meal food, but it's delicious and I'll have it occasionally. But if I was grilling to try and stay lean, I would gear more towards chicken, uh, lean steaks, like, you know, sirloin tip medallions or eye around or something like that, something leaner. Uh, even get some like lean turkey sausage or something like that if you want to have that. But, you know, try and go with the leanest cuts because the fatty cuts of meat, it's just super calorie dense. I mean, I know it tastes delicious and everything else, especially when it's cooked just right. But you're getting more fat calories than protein calories when you're eating the fatty cut of meat. Like if you're eating like a T-bone steak or sausages and, you know, juicy hamburgers and stuff like that, there's, there's more fat calories coming through than protein calories. So it's not the ideal fat burning meal. So it's more of a cheat meal stuff. So you got to look at it. How often are you doing it? Like if it's just an occasional thing and you want to have that as your cheat meal, then hey, kind of do what you want. But if it's a regular thing that you're doing, uh, then you're going to have to make smarter choices. And it's it's all a balancing act, right? It's like as long as you're making more good choices than bad, you can make it work. But once you start making more bad choices than good, then you're going to get fat. And that's like look around at the average person. If they're overweight and out of shape, they've been making more bad choices than good, right? So you just need to tip the scale, right? More good choices than bad. I'm not saying it has to be perfect. It just has to be good enough, but good enough consistently over the long term, right? All right, what else we got there? Uh, why do bodybuilders cut all their carbs near a show? Is it to see more definition and to lose water? Well, not all bodybuilders cut all their carbs, but... Generally speaking, they will restrict them to some degree. You know, if someone's trying to optimize fat or fat loss, they'll they'll cut back on their calories, which also includes cutting back on carbohydrates. Now, 
Some people do go on an extreme low carb diet. Others are more like myself, try to have a balance. Like when I'm following a fat loss diet or even just healthy eating in general, I try to have a balance. One third of my calories from protein, one third from fat, one third from carbohydrates and keep it in balance and proportion. And I find when you are in balance and proportion, it's a lot more sustainable and a lot more enjoyable. You don't go through the metabolic pitfalls of trying to cut out food groups or, you know, have, you know, super low carb or super low fat or any of that stuff. Right? When you have it in balance and you just either slight calorie deficit or slight calorie surplus based on what it is you're trying to achieve, it's a lot more sustainable. But why do bodybuilders manipulate and, and basically why, why do bodybuilders diet down? Exactly. It's, it's to lose the body fat and to reveal the definition because like even if you got a lot of muscle mass on your frame, if it's blurred by body fat, it's not going to look good, especially on a bodybuilding stage. Because on the stage, under those bright contest lights, you can't hide anything. If you've got any little bit of softness on your body at all, it's going to show up. And you, you can see this. If you ever go to see a bodybuilding competition in person, not YouTube videos and pictures, but you actually go and see it in person, you can actually appreciate this so much more. And you will see the people who are ripped and the people who are not ripped. And it's it's hard to appreciate it until you've actually been there, you know, up close and in person and see it. And the thing is, like what you see on stage under those lights, I mean, if, if somebody looks ripped and defined on stage under normal light, they're going to look absolutely ridiculous. And I mean, like they're going to look like just like an anatomy chart ripped because those contest lights are so unforgiving, meaning anything, any little softness or, you know, a thick skin or, or water retention or anything like that is going to show up, right? You can't hide anything under contest lights. Whereas under normal gym lights, regular lighting, you can hide some stuff based on shadows and all that. On, on contest stage, you ain't hiding nothing. <laughs> so people have to be ultra shredded in order to look good. And with very few exceptions, the most ripped competitor wins, right? That's the way bodybuilding and phys physique competitions are these days, right? The most ripped competitor who still has decent muscle. Now, I mean, obviously, if you got someone who's like 200 pounds and shredded and you got another guy who's 135 pounds and shredded, probably the 200 pound guy is going to win because it's still his bodybuilding. But if you have like you got a 200 pound shredded guy and then you got a 250 pound bulky guy. The 200 pound shredded guy will kick the 250 pound bulky guy's ass because he just looks so much better being lean and defined. All right. Definition is, is key. I mean, obviously, you got to have the muscle, but once the muscle is built, then it's, it's basically who's the most ripped competitor on stage. That's where it comes down to. Um, does weightlifting after 5 p.m. cause insomnia? It depends on the individual. I don't find it any issue. Like I used to do a lot of my workouts in the evening. Uh, for years, I always did workouts in the evening and I never had any issues with it. But you got to look at, I mean, everyone's unique. I mean, if it may for you. And you got to also look at like, why do you take them before those workouts? Like if you're slamming back a pre-workout with a shit ton of caffeine, it may cause trouble sleeping. And it's probably not so much the workout, even though the workout in and of itself can, you know, amp up your you know, endorphins and hormones and get you a bit jacked up. But usually within a few hours after the workout, everything settles down, right? And you'll be, be rested. But if you've took pre-workout and caffeine and stuff like that, that can stay in your system a long time, right? Like the half-life of caffeine is somewhere around six hours. So um, if, if you've <laughs> you slammed back a whole bunch of caffeine or coffee or whatever, I mean, that, that's still lingering in your system, right? Long after 5 p.m. <laughs> and that's probably why you're having trouble sleeping if, if you work out late in the later in the day. So you got to think of the bigger picture. I personally prefer to lift in the morning. Uh, in my situation, like I, I like to have breakfast and then work out. So I don't want to be like first thing in the morning, like before the sun rises and all that stuff. And I like to wake up, let, let, let my body wake up, you know, have a cup of coffee, have my breakfast and all that kind of stuff and let it settle for a while and then go to the gym. And I find like a mid morning workout, you know, somewhere around like nine o'clock in the morning works really well for me. That's when I feel and function 
my best. And, and that's relatively unique because in the past, uh, I used to always be a night owl. I used to work out in the evenings. Um, but now that my son is born, you know, he's got to be to school in the morning and all that. The way it works is we get him up, get him ready for school, get him out the door and everything else. And once he's gone to school, then my wife and I, we get ready to go to the gym. And that works really good for our schedule. And I find it works well with my sleep habits too, because by getting the workout done early in the day, um, I don't have any issues falling asleep then later at night. But uh, yeah, it's, it's something you're going to have to experiment with. So if you find that the 5 p.m. or later workouts are hindering your sleep, try and do it earlier in the day. See how that works. Just try and rearrange some things. All right, we have L Lamar saying, can I still get newbie gains at the age of 34? If you're a newbie, yeah. <laughs> Anytime you start training, you're, you're going to experience what we refer to as newbie gains. And what newbie gains are is basically your body is not accustomed to training stimulation. So anything you do is going to produce a positive result, assuming you're getting adequate recovery and nutrition and, and all that stuff. Like any type of training you do consistently and progressively is, is going to work. Like it doesn't have to be perfect, right? That's anybody who's consistent will make initial gains uh, in, the, in the early phases. And you're thinking like age 34, we got guys in the muscle after 40 blueprint. Um, one person, Paul Miller started working out at 62 at the first time ever, like no athletic background, First time ever stepped foot inside a gym at age 62. And now he's in his late 60s and in the best shape of his life. Uh, I got another guy. I featured him on my uh, Facebook just recently. Mike Brown started working out. I can't remember exactly. I'm trying. Somewhere in his mid 50s. I'll have to double check, right? If, if you're watching this, Mike, I forget your, your exact age you started at, but I know it was somewhere around mid 50s. And now he's. Uh, in his late 50s and in the best shape of his life. Like I'm talking visible abdominal definition, muscular, like crazy gains, and he made him in his 50s. So it's it's never too old. Like a lot of people think, well, oh, I'm 30 years old. Am I too old? I'm 40 years old. Am I too old? No, like start now. <laughs> You're never going to be as young as you are right now. And, and the thing is, is if you don't start now, then 10 years is going to go by and then you'll be looking back and kicking yourself saying, oh shit, I wish I had started back when I was 34, right? Or whatever. Like just start now. Don't, don't overthink it. That's the biggest mistake that most people make when it comes to workouts is they overthink and they procrastinate and they paralysis by analysis and all that BS. Like just, just do it. Like don't overthink it. Just do it. That's the, the, the biggest cause of failure is not from poor decisions. It's from no decisions, right? Just inaction just deer in the headlights, right? You know, like, duh, I don't know what to do. Like, just make a freaking decision, jump in, start taking action, right? Don't worry about trying to figure out all the details before you get started. Like, we'll figure out the details as we go. Just get started. Start now. <laughs> that's, that's the best advice I can give anybody, right? Okay, moving on. Uh, Robert's joining in. He says, going to get going at 52. Everything hurts, but in a good way. Yeah, well, it's it's normal for everything to hurt initially. Uh, but the big thing is start small. Like the, the biggest mistake a lot of people make when they start a new program is they try to do too much too soon. And it's usually from impatience. And it's also from just piss and vinegar motivation and stuff like that. And and I think the, the root cause of it all is truly impatience. It's like you 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 let yourself go so much, right? Like you've been neglecting your health and fitness for years. You've gotten fat. You're out of shape. And finally, you hit the your threshold. Something something triggered you. Something set you off. The straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Something happened where you said like, shit, I, I, I'm not happy with my physique anymore. I'm not happy with my health and fitness. That's it. No more. I'm fed up. I'm making a change today. I'm getting my shit together and I'm going to make a change starting today. And then you, in, you go for like 10 years doing nothing. And then all of a sudden you're in the gym three hours a day, six days a week and burning the candle at both ends. And you go from zero to hero overnight. Like that's just a recipe for disaster. That's just going to lead to burnout, frustration and aches, pains and injuries. Like start off small. And, and the simple solution to all this 
you just have to be better than you were before. So if you were doing nothing <laughs> before, then something is better than you were before, right? Like a 10-minute workout is better than no workout. And it could literally be as small as that. Like you could be starting off just small baby steps. Like, hey, maybe we'll get outside and go for a walk today, right? If I haven't exercised in the last year, let's start by just putting on my sneakers and walking around the block. Like, okay, let's do that. You know, when it comes to coming, when when it comes to going to the gym, maybe I'm just going to do like a little 20 minute circuit routine on some of the machines. You know, just do one or two sets of of all these little circuits, just kind of go through the motions, and then that's it. Like, just give yourself permission to do something small, and then all you got to do is a little bit better than it was before. So, for example, like if if you today you you or this week you walked around the block for 10 minutes, next week let's try go for 11 minutes. You know, at the gym, if you did a little 20 minute circuit routine three times a week, well, hey, let's try and do a 25 minute circuit routine three times a week next week. Like just build it up little bit by little bit. Don't try and dive headfirst into the deep end and sink or swim because most people are in, they're going to sink. Like that that's why you see like New Year's resolutions. So many people like after the holidays, they all feel fat and guilty and everything else. And like, oh, that's it. I got to go on some crazy New Year's diet, right? Resolution, blah, blah, blah. And they join the gym and they're working out three hours a day while they're slashing their calories to ridiculous, you know, I'm eating a thousand calories a day, one meal, ketogenic diet bullshit. Like, give me a break, right? You, you haven't exercised and dieted for a full year and now you're going to try and lose it all in the matter of like a month. Like, no, it ain't going to happen, <laughs> right? Like, be realistic here. <laughs> so just start small, be better than you were before and just let those little baby steps of progress compound. Like 1% better each day. That's a mindset that I always teach my coaching students. Like instead of trying to overhaul everything from day one and go from zero to hero, let's just get 1% better each day. 1%. Like, how can we be a little better than you were before? And we've got a full system in place where we take people through this process and show them how to actually make those 1% improvements, you know, how to evaluate what you're currently doing. And like, how can we just tweak it a little bit so that it's a slightly better choice, a slightly better improvement? And it doesn't seem like much and it doesn't seem overwhelming or painful or suffering it out or any of that crap. But it's like, those little tiny tweaks, you do them day after day, week after week, month after month. And like by this time next year, you could look back and say like, holy smokes, like look at the transformation that took place. But it didn't feel overwhelming in the process. It was actually quite enjoyable and it didn't feel like you were suffering it out or burning the candle at both ends. And it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm I can't stand it anymore. I, I hate my life because I'm <laughs> on a diet and all this kind of stuff. It's actually more enjoyable to make these small, subtle changes and reap the results slowly over time. And over time, it sounds like a long time, Like, but in reality, if, if it took you 10 years to get out of shape and you can undo it in one year, is that really a long time? No. <laughs> it's actually quite rapid when you look at the bigger picture. And I mean, imagine this time next year, you had your health and fitness under control and it was no longer an issue. Like, that's the reality. Like, it can't happen, right? I mean, one of my coaching students, uh, Steve Patterson, prime example, I mean, when he reached out to me, he was 260 pounds, not heading in a good direction, right? Health and fitness and everything else was like rock bottom. And he came on board with the Muscle After 40 Blueprint. And in one year, exactly one year to the day, he lost 101 pounds and totally transformed his life. I mean, we featured him up on my website and we did a video interview together. I mean, it's just an amazing transformation, right? I mean, that that's what's possible. If you just focus on getting better than you were before and you follow a proven system that works, right? So, I mean, if that's something you're interested in or something you'd like to talk about, feel free to reach out to me. We can have a chat about it. All right, guys, I'm going to clue it up. Holy shit, I went for an hour and 23 minutes. I always say I'm going to go for an hour, but I go longer, right? It's, once I get the gift of gab going, I go I go long, right? I, I my, my wife even asked me before I, I came down here to start this chat. She said, how long are you going to go today? And I said, oh, I'm only going to go for an hour. That's all, one hour, right? Almost an hour and a half later, I'm still yakking. <laughs> anyway, gentlemen, boys, girls, ladies, gentlemen, people of the congregation, I'm going to get ready and clue it up. Hopefully you enjoyed the video chat. I enjoyed doing it. And I'll get the replay of this posted up within the sometime over the weekend, hopefully, with all the video Q&A and timestamps and all that stuff. 
And in the meantime, if you would like some help with a fitness and nutrition program, or if you would like to just elaborate on any of the questions and topics of discussion today, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me, lee at leehayward.com, or you can friend me up over on Facebook. I'm quite active over on Facebook. That is my social media platform of choice. So feel free to reach out to me over there. Just do a search for Lee Hayward. You'll find me. It's facebook.com forward slash Lee dot Hayward. That's my Facebook URL profile and friend me, friend me up. And uh, in the meantime, have yourself a fantastic weekend. And I look forward to talking to you next Friday, same time, same place. And I'm going to have to get a more solid table because I'm each, every time I knock it, I'm shaking my laptop here. So uh, <laughs> I apologize if the video is shaking all over the place, but that's just me. I'm going to have to get a more solid table. Anyway, take care guys. I'll talk to you next week.